Erst wenn tun. Das das ist ein Problem. Das But
so I am um, I haven't heard any humor talk up to me. Hmm. Yeah, I call on my phone. Hmm? Yeah, I call on my phone. understand that the son and the daughter is somewhere in Delaford on their way so we want to give that respect to the family before we actually start today's service is that okay uh, we'll be getting started very shortly Delaford is not a far place so let's give them that respect so that we can start with the family good the fact that you are here to give that support because in these times people need the kind of support so we are so happy that you have made your way to support the entire family we are so glad all right so feel free be relaxed and we want to give a good send off today amen Maybe it's done there. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. 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 Send it. Send it. Let me. Let me tell you what to send it. Send it on my wife. Wife of a wife of a really good mentor. Let me give her number. All right. Let me give her email. Tell her not join. Hmm? Okay, she joined. She has step and she told her to like and she joined. You think she knows? 
Hi, hi, can you hear me? Tell me something now. Hello, can you hear? Hi, can you? Can you hear me? Yes, I see him coughing right now. Uh, good. Yes. Uh, hi, how are you doing? How is Hot Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. I think I'm hearing you on Steve's phone. When, whenever you come on the screen, uh -huh. it's your time to talk. Just now, hold on. I think I'm hearing you on I'm hearing you. Just now. I am hearing you on Steve's phone. I'm not hearing you on my phone. Can you hear me on my phone?
Delighted that you are here today to be a part of this funeral service. Amen? So we are about to start. Bless the Lord. And so, and so we want to move ahead, move ahead quickly, quickly 
as we, as we have our praise, praise, praise and worship at his name, and let me ask to the Lord of his name, and lead and us all the songs to sing together. together. Amen. 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 If you have a program, there are, there are songs, songs on the streets, so let's follow in, in order. order. Bless the Lord. Lord. I greet you with your wonderful name of your Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So soon come and 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 come and
is a miracle work with God. Amen. You have to see so wonderful people. Amen. Amen. It's a miracle with yourself when you think about salvation. salvation. Amen. And how God, God can send his only son, only son to die for us. And then we, and then we have, in terms, in terms of the context of what we are dealing with today, we have what the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, verse 11 declares, the declares the Lord. Amen. And this is a physical for the family. For I know, I know the thoughts that I think towards, towards, towards you, says the Lord. The Lord. Thoughts, of thoughts of peace and not of and evil. Not evil. So good God. God. Amen. Amen. To give, to give you an expected end. end. In other words, In other words today, today you can really depend, depend and trust in God, trust in God even, even while, while you're grieving. grieving. Amen. Amen. Because God, because God says that He knows your thoughts. thoughts. Amen. Amen. That He thinks towards, towards you. you. It, is it is always good. Amen. God, Amen. God is merciful. Is merciful. Amen. God, Amen. God, God is, is very generous, generous towards us. Even when, Even when we are not, we are not really inclined in time towards him, his love, his love is still for all of us. Amen? Amen? And, that's and that's what the Bible says, that, that even while we were sinners, Christ, Christ died, died for us. For us. All, of us. all of us. Amen? Amen? And so we, and so want, we to want to move along, move along with the program this time. time. And we are going to move to the aspect of tributes. And let me just remind us. Amen. Amen. All of us will have something to say. And we, and we can use the whole afternoon. But I would really, really prefer, if when we, if when we come, that we make it short, short and, sweet. and sweet. And so, to start, to start our tributes this afternoon, we'll be having, we'll be having Mr. Stephen Moore, Moore. Will, come will come at this time. At this time. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm seeing I'm also, also, also sung by, sung by more brothers. brothers. Is that it? All right, let, All right, them, let come them come at this time and do the and family. Do the family. The family. Yes. yes. Come quickly. Come quickly. Oh, 
someday we will exchange our crown. Our cross, sorry. For more than crown.
Let's go. In times like 
While we sort it out, because we need him to, to make his tribute, while we sort it out, we can just have at this time uh, the scripture reading, and that will be taken from Psalms chapter 90. And Mr. Tyreek Lovelace will come at this time and do the scripture while we get the technology in place. Yeah. Uh, the scripture reading will be taken from Psalms 
Psalms 19. And it reads, The Lord thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed them, and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou, thou art God. Thou tellest man to destruction, and says, Return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. When it is past, and as a watch in the night, thou carriest them away with a flood. They are as yes. In the morning, they are like grass which grow. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and grows. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our, side, our secret sin, sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tear that is in Thank you so much. We want to try a second time to see if we can get through now with Mr. Stephen Moore. Could you just give us a sound check, Mr. Moore? No, I'm not hearing you. Okay, are you hearing me now? Yes, sir. Keep it right. All right, right okay. Let's get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, family and friends. Greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. This is Steve, Alan's younger brother, paying a tribute to Alan. Alan Moore, born March. Hello? Hello? Yes, we are hearing you. Yeah, hello? Yeah, hello? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Alan Moore. Born March 9, 1942 to Viola and Conrad Moore in Charlottesville, Tobago. Alan was the 11th of 13 children of that union. As a little boy, Alan spoke with a stutter, and he was a fast talker. And when he was asked his and his little brother Steve's name, he would say, iron and steel. And they would ask, iron and steel? And he would say, no, iron and steel. So the sum of the neighbors, we were iron and steel. Alan was an enterprising boy. He loved music and showed an early affinity to making music. Our dad had a violin, and we used to sneak and pluck the strings. And Alan took pleasure in plucking those strings and enjoying the various songs. Seeing that we were not permitted to touch our father's guitar, uh, his violin, excuse me, Alan decided to make his own instrument 
by cutting a piece of bamboo, about two joints, and splitting it in half. Then carve out four strings from the surface of piece of that bamboo. Then he would place two small pieces of sticks under the strings at each end of the bamboo. And voila, a banjo capable of making music emerged. Alan learned to play his banjo, and the boys loved to hear him play. And he enjoyed entertaining them. That was the start of what was to become Alan's Paris with the guitar. As little boys at Christmas time, Alan used to make some beautiful kites of all shapes and sizes, and enough for the boys in the neighborhood who may need one, but of course at a price. In addition to flying kites at Christmas time, we used to look forward to Father Christmas, Santa Claus to the modern folks, bringing gifts on Christmas Eve night. And one Christmas morning, Father Christmas put a mouth organ, a harmonica, in Alan's stocking that he hung up on Christmas Eve. When Alan got up Christmas morning, he found his mouth organ. And boy, he blew the dickens out of that mouth organ. So later, he became an ace harmonica player. As boys going to school, Alan was brilliant. But he was a fierce protector of his little brother, me, of course. He used to warn the boys to keep their hands off his little brother because anyone who dare interfere with Steve would have to tangle with him. So your humble servant used to walk tall without any fear of the boys, thanks to my big brother, Alan. Later on, Alan embarked on learning carpentry and worked in Mount St. George, where he met the girl of his dream, Rebecca Roberts, who he would later marry and have a family. Alan used to carry himself well. He would dress sharp and look sharp. His shoes were always shining with some long tips, commonly known as kick and stab shoes. Who remember those? Sometime later, Alan bought a car and wow, he used to drive that car fast. He was also a bus driver and whether driving his car or the bus, he was going so fast, it's like, whoa, go Charlie. So somewhere during those experiences, they coined the name nickname Go Charlie, a name which stuck with him. Alan moved to Trinidad sometimes later, and while exploring his musical talents, he would visit Sagom's store, one of the stores in Port of Spain that used to sell musical instruments. In that store, Go Charlie would check out the electric guitars by playing a few chords. Then he would start to pick some tunes as a lead guitarist would. And before long, folks would gather in the store and on the pavement just to listen to this ace guitarist. He perfected the art of lead guitarist to the point where he joined combo bands and played lead guitar, playing in parties and dances. Go Charlie had a mind of his own. And later in his life, he decided to experiment with herbs and found one that, according to him, why me like I'm bad. So he did some things, so he did his own thing and made some choices that were not always to his best interest, which led him down a rocky road and caused him to be hospitalized. One day he walked out of the hospital and came to my house. I was living in Arima at the time and I had five fierce dogs which didn't allow anything or anyone to enter my premises. But early that morning, four day morning, Go Charlie came and opened the gate came in and sat on the steps and the dogs did not utter a bark and they greeted Go Charlie as a friend. A friend indeed he was. His unfortunate experiences caused Alan to lose touch with his family for a while. But fate was kind and with the help of family, he was able to dust himself out and embarked on a new and different path which led to a more stable and acceptable situation that carried through to the end. Alan was born into a Christian family, and despite his challenges, he lived to the age of 80, which, all things considered, is pretty good, and is 10 more than the three scores on 10. He leaves to mourn Rebecca, his wife, his children, 
Ricky, Sherman, Sheldon, Sherian, Avalon, Sherlene, and Candice. His siblings, Ibrona, Dorothea, Steve, and Peter, and his extended family. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Rest in peace, my brother. God bless. Thank you. Congratulations and some friends, Paul Edwards, Mary Joy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charlotte Moore, and we are here today, physically and virtually, to celebrate the life of my father, Alan Moore, and to gain closure and to bring closure to this chapter in our lives. Alan Moore, also known as Go Charlie, or just Charlie, was born on the 9th of March, 1942, to Conrad and Moore. He made three score and ten, and yes. ten, yes. 80 years. We have to hope and pray we make those kind of numbers. He was the 11th child out of a total of 13 children. As a child, my aunt, Thoreau said, he was always neatly dressed, and he would return from school with his pants well seen. He loved his guitar, and would sit and play under a tree. Aunt Thoreau said, as a child, they would have to pick limes to sell. But instead of helping them out, he sat, and guess what he did? Played his guitar. His passion was music. He later joined the band, as you heard earlier, a live band in Monk St. George. I think the name is Magic Strings, and that's when he played and entertained the masses. In our house, personally, he always had a guitar and a mouth organ, and we'll hear more about that later. My father's trade was carpentry, so he came to the village of Monk St. George to build the houses. He stayed at the place opposite to the house my mom resided. He would come across and chat, or as we like to say, he was tracking the young lady, <laughs> chat with her, and so their love blossomed. He would later marry Rebecca Moore, Rebecca Roberts, sorry, that's my mom, in 1968 at the Scarborough Methodist Church. This marriage bore eight children, five girls and three boys. My mother said he was a good husband and father. He married his children them for sure, all of them. He was very smart, but unfortunately he got sick at one point. My sister Rosetta, Sherry Ann, said he was proud of his girl child. Probably because she really resembled him as Sherry and Riley. He even registered her for, for school, I'm told. Um, Sherry used to go to Roxbury Secondary School and she gave me a story while I was preparing this. As you know, he used to drive bus, so it was one day she was driving in the bus and 
they were coming home, a lot of children in the bus. And then all of a sudden they started smelling like smoke. And then the bell, and the bell caught a fire. So the children started running and rushing to the front. And I don't know if she stood there in the back. And Daddy looked back and gave this girl a good move. He was like, Sherry, you in back there, you could even say, Daddy, the bus catch a fire. She was so embarrassed. But it formed part of her, of her memory. He was the one who gave Shirley a name. A name she was, well, she really loves that name. My mom said my father um, wanted to show his affection openly as he walked the streets by holding hands. But being the shy person, she didn't allow it. She said one day they were walking in Port of Spain. And my father saw a couple in front of them holding hands. And he turned to her and, her and said, that is how a man was walk with a woman. <laughs> His sister Inez helped him to get a job as a bus conductor with the Public Transport Service Corporation. His supervisor, the late Mr. Washington, will always say his money never short. He was not just satisfied being a bus conductor. He wanted to get his driver's permit to become a bus driver. My mom said my father would ask her to pick her up when he was learning his regulation. This man, Alan Moore, was an excellent bus driver. So I'm told he never got into an accident. Everyone loved him and only wanted to drive with him. He loved martial arts and would take his boys to classes with him. The only movie he rented were karate movies. As children, you either watch it or you go to your bed. He was passionate about karate. I still remember some of the movies. He loved running and would run the 26 marathon in Trinidad every year and would always finish. He had stamina and was strong. Some call him Hazel Crawford, Hazley Crawford, sorry, because he was always running in the village to ensure his fitness. So who was this man and how did he influence me? One, he was quiet. He would sit quietly on a stool on a rock in the yard and meditate. I can still remember where he sat. I am like that too, and though I don't sit on a stool or a rock. But I like the peace and quietness. I like to be alone with my thoughts. I like to sit still and think and reflect, usually at the end of the day. I grew up not just quiet, but introverted. Not sure where that went, because now I'm like all out there. He was respectful. We grew up learning respect. Simple things like saying good morning, knocking on the door before you enter were a must. Never mind we used to peep through the crack in the door before we knock. But we got the message. You know, it's important to announce your presence. Don't just barge in, right? I'm all grown up now, different environment, but as the same goes, the child is a part of the man. The behavior, my behavior, activities of any person in childhood who are a long way in building their personality. I can't help but be respectful of this very day, even, well, more especially to my elders. When we all know the man was an ardent, passionate, zealous, devoted, dedicated runner. It was part of his daily routine. He would rise early in the morning and run. When he returned, he would be drenched in sweat, soaked in perspiration. I don't know why he was so committed to running. Maybe it's in preparation for his marathon run, as you did earlier. But I myself, I find myself doing the same thing, but for very good reasons. You know, after a long day, sitting for hours, a good job could be so refreshing. It serves as a de-stressor keeps me calm, but pumped with adrenaline and dopamine. 
dopamine is what they call sometimes the happy hormone. It's a primary driver of the brain's reward system. It spikes when you experience something pleasurable. Yeah. So sometimes after a good run, I don't know, I just feel like on a high, like a natural high. No words to do that. So jogging, running produces a healthy lifestyle. If you want to lose weight, maintain weight, stay fit, keep your heart rate up, de-stress, don't wait for a doctor to tell you to walk, jog, run. Just do it. So whether you walk like Shireen and my mother, run like sherry Ann, or just get your exercise by going to the gym like Avlan, Shilman, just jog. Be physical, physically active. Do something. It's necessary for good health. There were times when I would come to Charlottesville to visit my father. Sometimes I would go by Tapa, who took care of him for a while, which I'm very grateful for. Other times I would decide to go straight to the beach because I knew the man. I knew as part of his routine he would walk to the beach and just chill. He did that in his late 70s. In his late 70s he would get up and walk. Just before he fell and hit his knees. He was honest. When he fell, and his knees on his way home one day, the report I got was there was a water leak for quite a while there and it caused him to slip. Well, I was ready to deal with Wasa. Pre-action letter, done drafted everything, ready to send out. But he said he wasn't sure he slipped because of the water. His conscience wasn't clear, so he chose not to pursue the matter. And I respect that. Yes. I am kind of just the same like that. I let my conscience, you know, that moral sense of right or wrong, yeah. be my dad. There's no sense fighting against yourself. I'd rather take the honest part. He was strong-willed. I'm just going to look at the good part, though. There was a time when he fell sick and couldn't walk. So we thought, well, that was it. It seemed like he would be confined to a bed. But to our surprise, the man started to walk again. I believe that it was partly due to his exercise regimen, but his strong will to walk, again, definitely played a great part. He was the type, if he made up his mind to do something, he would do it. And he made up his mind to walk, and his body had no choice but to respond. That is another thing I took from him. If I put my mind to it, the rest of me will fall in line. It will be done. He was a musician. He loved music. He loved playing the guitar and the harmonica. You know traditionally how people would hum, hum to music? It was like this man had a, a bass man in his head. It's very strange. He would hum the bass line of music. Well, I can't help myself when I was concerned. I love the bass, I play the bass, and I do the same thing, just like him. It's so strange. Um, Uncle Peter, I didn't know you played the bass by the way. That was... That was awesome. I grew up with a guitar in the house. It seemed natural that I would gravitate to it because I was musically inclined. I'm not as skillful as the man. I'm getting there, though. After the recorder, which I learned to play in Scarborough Secondary School, Junior Secondary School, that was my next instrument, the guitar. The harmonica, well, you heard my cousin play it beautifully. I don't know how he and I don't know how they do that. It seemed like a rather complicated instrument. Something I may look into in the future, something he may look simple, but we'll see. I have learned to see the good in people. Take the good and let it make you better. That's exactly what I did and I hope you will do the same too. I thank you. Excellent. Amen. That was well done, Mr. Sheldon. Amen. Beautiful. And he said something there in the eulogy that really stood out to me. Since I came to Charlottesville as the pastor of this church, 
something that I found out about the people. That one feature that he spoke about, very respectful. Very respectful. And that would have been a feature that was taught to them by the elders. And not just in the church, but in the entire village. They are very respectful to you. Yeah, even Mr. Jemo, when he sees me, he does like this, pastor, pastor. So I feel so welcome in Charlotteville. And I'm, I'm asking that we don't lose that, 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 that element of respect for each other. I'm asking that we continue in this village to love and respect one another, like Mr. Allen would have done and taught his children so that his son could come today and stand up and says, my father was like this. That's wonderful. Could you please give him another round of applause? <laughs> and so, today we are stuck with the moors and they, they just keep coming and coming. And at this time we're gonna have special item from Miss Candice Moore Loveless. Take your time. A pleasant afternoon to each and everyone. Before I do this tribute, I would just like to say thanks to everyone that is here and even on the live. And I truly want to thank Pastors Russell and my Andrew for journeying all the way from Staten Island to be wow. here with us. Beautiful. The song is titled Heaven Came Down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I would never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. And oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. job. Amen. Pastor Russell, I recognize that he 
would have been instrumental over the years in supporting the family. And the fact that he could have traveled from Staten Island to be here with us today, I think that it's fitting for me to give him two minutes to come and just to encourage the family. Bless the Lord. Come on, somebody, give him praise. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, I sat there, and as a believer, you can rejoice in any situation. Are you with me? Yes. I am my sister and her husband, Sister Rebecca Moore. In fact, I'm her pastor in the States. I have my wife there who is the sister-in-law, the sister's her brother-in-law. A lot of family here. And I just want to thank God for the mods. I know everybody, you know, see them grow up in my house when before I migrate. And I just want to say to you all that God is still a God of comfort. Amen. That is the God that the Apostle Paul introduced the Corinthian saints and us today. He said, the God of all comfort. You can rest assured that in this time, he's right aside of you. Amen, somebody. And this is a reminder to all of us. This service is not about Alan. This is to remind us that one of these days, we will go this way. Amen. You know, I'm in Tobago since the 22nd of July. Keep some meeting in our guy. And I was saying to them the last night, God is saying, prepare to meet him. Come on, somebody. We prepare for everything. But we are not preparing to meet God. This is a wake-up call. The Bible says Adam lived 930 years and he died. His son said, lived 912 years and he died. Jared lived 962 years and he died. The oldest man in the Bible. You can find his name there. I don't want to mess up his name. In Genesis chapter 5 verse 27. The Bible says he lived 969 years and he died. It's appointed unto men. Once to die and after that the judgment. But I say to people, as long as there is life, there is hope. Amen. So be encouraged this evening. God bless you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Thank you so much. And so we are getting ready to hear from the word of God. And this pastor that is here with us today in support also of the family, he would have been very instrumental over the years in my life in bringing me to Christ in Della Ford. And so today, I'd like to introduce you to speak to us at this time, the pastor of the Streams of Power Pentecostal Church, Pastor Selby Nimblet. Praise God, let me say a pleasant good afternoon. I didn't hear you say a pleasant good afternoon. And greetings in the precious name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, God is a good God. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's not always or it has never been a nice thing to preach at a funeral service. But I always take the opportunity to make sure I share with you the heartbeat of God for all mankind. Note I said all and not some. All mankind. Amen. However, let me extend greatest sympathy to the bereaved family, friends, and those of you who are viewing this 
funeral service via the social media network, all social media network, whether it be Facebook or YouTube. Dearly beloved, we uh, gather in this fashion this afternoon to reflect and um, Sheldon would have done an excellent job and I can't remember the name of the gentleman if it was Steve who would have also give, done an excellent job in giving us a brief reflection on the life of Alan Moore aka Charlie and I I'm here with mixed feelings this afternoon. However, I'm privileged to be the speaker at Alan's home going ceremony. Hallelujah. Home going ceremony. Alan, as the old people will say, mash up 80 almanacs. The young people that we have in the world today, they are not even mashing up as much as 20. Many are dying before they reach the age of 20. Some of us are barely scraping it through to 50. Alan live over 29,200 days which equivalent to over 4,160 weeks. We are all privileged and we should all count it an honor to have met him, to have had an encounter with him. I met Alan very late and I've had many conversations with him and for those of you who know Alan um, very strong headed very strong will we are I'm here about the salvation of your soul because your soul is more important and you see we are living in a time where many people are concerned about who is right and wrong and, and that should be a concern but for me as a pastor, I am not concerned about what is right and wrong. I'm concerned about what is godly. I want to say that again. I'm concerned about what is godly. You see, because not everything that is right or wrong is godly. Not everything that is good, rather, is godly. Let me put it this way. Let me give you an example. Jesus walked the face of the earth and there was a debate on who should do what and who should not do what on the Sabbath day. And these disciples, they went in the cornfield and they ate with what? On wash hands. And an argument started and they said to Jesus, Jesus, your disciples ate with on wash hands. Now it is good practice, it is ethical it is hygienic to wash your hands before you eat isn't it but what was more important to Jesus wasn't whether they were eating with unwashed hands or not as the Pharisees were concerned about Jesus was more concerned about the eternal destiny Amen. of all men and he said to them you are making the gospel you are making the good news of none effect because of what your tradition so there are some traditions that are good but not necessarily godly not necessarily will take you to eternity and i'm not concerned about right and wrong i'm concerned about what is godly because you see we are living in a world where everybody tell you they are right the pentecostals tell you they are right the adventists the methodists the moravian the norarian everybody tells you that they are right but i hear my bible says let god be true and every man a liar i hear my bible says and 
that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. The only right I know of is Jesus. And therefore why I had my debates with Alan about religion, politics, you name it. We, we had some debates. And I remember saying to him, I'm not here to win an argument. I'll give you win. I lose. I'll give you win. But what is concern? What I'm concerned about is your soul. Your soul. Your eternal what? Destiny. Amen. Because some of us are so out of place. Some of us are so, uh, I mean, um, um, brass face that we will go before the almighty God and still try to win an argument with him. True. Come on, talk to me. Even when Jesus was walking the earth, the Pharisees, they had him in all sorts of debates trying to win an argument. And he wasn't concerned about right and wrong. He was concerned about the salvation of their souls. He was concerned about their eternal destiny. And I want us to think about what I'm saying. If you are religious, you will be offended. If you are not religious you will have a problem with what I say. But if you are godly, you will be embracing of truth. Come on, listen to me. Say, if you are godly, you will be embracing of truth. I don't preach religion, because religion ain't taking none of us in heaven. I don't preach that, beloved. I am hard on Pentecostal, like I said, plenty coastal will go to hell. Let me say that again. Plenty coastals will go to hell. So I don't spend time, even though I'm a Pentecostal minister, amen, I, I, I don't preach Pentecostalism, I preach the kingdom of God. When Jesus came on the earth, he said repent for the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say repent for Pentecostals are here, Adventists, Methodists, Roman Catholics, he said repent for the kingdom. He said, except a man be born again, he shall not be able to enter into the kingdom. So I am a kingdom preacher. When Jesus preached, he said, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. I have not seen any of our church names in the Bible. So why stuck on church? Why stuck on religion? Beloved, I am stuck on a relationship with God. You see, people who have religion still haunt their wives. You didn't hear what I just said. People who have religion haunt their wives. People who have religion cuss out their neighbor. Come on, people who have religion thief. People who have religion, come on, talk to me, somebody. Live all sorts of ungodly life. But when you have a relationship with God, you will say like Paul, in him I live, in him I move, and in him I have my being. This is about a relationship with God. Time for religion to go out of the door and for us to build a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I, I even haven't I don't even start preaching as yet let me get with my notes mm, Jesus whenever people die whenever people die listen to me carefully whenever people die there are some questions that I ask myself and I want you to ask yourself these questions because they are diagnostic questions. They are questions for you to examine your, your heart, for you to do an introspection. Amen. For you to look into your life's condition presently. Forget about yesterday. There's nothing you did yesterday you can go back and fix. But I am certain you may be able to correct some things going forward so you don't make the same mistakes going forward that you did yesterday. But I'm saying, amen, I'm not concerned about all of that. I'm concerned about these questions questions beloved these diagnostic question one what legacy did you leave when anybody die I ask myself this question what legacy did they leave for successive generation and I'm not talking about social legacy I'm not talking about talking about skill legacy Alan was a skillful guitarist come on talk to me I heard a gentleman play 
Amen. The, 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 what you call it? The harmonica. Amen. I've never seen anything like that with my real eyes or heard anything like that. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I've never heard anything like that. That skills legacy. That's talent legacy. But the legacy I want to leave behind, beloved, is what Abraham left. It's the one that Jacob left. Come on, it's the one that Moses left. That even today when you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, their names are mentioned there as the heroes of faith. I want to leave a faith legacy. Now you can do all of these good things, social legacy, you're a good social activist, good politician, good all of that. All of that is good brothers and sisters. And when you die, amen, in your eulogy, they will, they will state all the good things that you have done, amen. But what about your faith legacy? And the Bible tells me that the just shall live. The just shall live. And the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the Bible tells us that we must have the faith of God. When I die, I don't care about how good a guitarist I play the guitar to. I play the bass, I play the drums. Not as skillfully as those guys. Amen. And I just pick up those instruments and, and watch people play and start playing. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I could sing a little. Come on. If I ask for things that I high, should not ask for, if I pray for things selfishly, you'll come streams of our next Sunday and you'll get the rest. Amen. But I'm not concerned about all of those things are good and you should be a good citizen, a, a, a good community person. You should make your contributions. Come on, talk to me. And all of that is good, whether you're a lawyer, you're a teacher, you're a doctor, you're a politician. All of those are good things, beloved. But I want to be a child of God upon this earth. Amen. I want to represent God. Amen. I want when I walk the street, they must say, there goes a godly man. There comes a godly man. Come on. I want to honor God in my life because when I die, I'm not going to take my talent with me. When I die, it is my lifestyle. It is my holiness that is going to qualify me to meet God. The Bible says without holiness no man with Without holiness, no woman shall see God. And these were the kind of conversation I was talking to Alan about. I said I'm concerned about your legacy in terms of your soul. Not the things, not all your accomplishments. Not how skillful you were as a guitarist and, and, and a bassist and all of that. I'm concerned about your eternal destiny. And if you are to die now. So I asked him that, what legacy are you leaving for a successive generation? Faith legacy. Oh, Jesus. Not concerned about material legacy. You will die and leave that. Mr. John, you are skillful on that. You don't know if your shot is going to call before the year out. None of us know. I don't know if my shot is going to call while preaching. I have a good the covering past of mine. It was on the pulpit that he took in. He, he died pre doing what he loved, preaching. I don't know what is going to happen to me the next second from now. But what I'm concerned about is my faith legacy. I also ask the question, what preparation did those individuals make for the transition of their lives from time to eternity? listen to this carefully what trans what preparation all of you prepare for the harvest yeah. but something ought to be wrong with our people you know? just recently we had COVID I had COVID too. I had COVID I almost full a whole pail one night just passing urine I had COVID too Many people had COVID, and while they had COVID, they were doing probably like myself, Lord, spare my life. 
Lord save my life while I was praying and asking God to save my life so that I can continue to preach his gospel some of you were praying and asking God to save your life to fit talk to me somebody you are asking God to spare your life to do the very things that God hates and I hear it when you go to function and they begin the function with an opening word of prayer and then after that you hear jump up and wave and whine and dine. Just pray and ask Almighty God to bless God or bless mess. Somebody else does it but not God, the devil. Listen to me, I said the devil does it. And if you understand this preacher, this guy will tell you I don't fear no man except God. You could like me, you could hate me, you could despise me, you could do whatever. That's your business. <laughs> as long as God loves me is what matters, beloved. And that is why I preach anything, anywhere, say what I want to say as long as it is in keeping with the word of God. I am not concerned. Too many preachers today are concerned about who is or who isn't offended when they preach. I'm not concerned about your offense. I'm concerned about declaring the word of God for what it is. Isn't that what Jesus said? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What we need in this age beloved is the word of God to take us through some of you already had your three scores and ten and still want to whine I see an old old woman on TV amen bending down and getting a young man on she bumper this kind of madness and if preachers talk about it people are offended well, let me tell you something. If you sit by this preacher or under this preacher, you will be offended every Sunday because I address sin and I speak about righteousness. Now is not time. Let me tell you something. Now is not time. Ask yourself the question. What preparation are you making? We prepare for everything. Some of us even prepare for death. But have we prepared for eternity? Come on, talk to me. Some of you already written your will. Some of you already did what? Come on, talk to me. Went to the, 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 the mortuary. Amen. Some, and, or, or, or the federal home rider. And already select your casket, your coffin. And you tell yourself that here's something. When I die, amen, I already have my indemnity there to take care of me. But let me say something to you, beloved. That's just preparation for this natural life. What preparation are you making for your spiritual life? let me tell you something religion don't help you do that I know some of you are already angry because I talk about religion because some people are more cling to their religion than they are to Christ my church say and we believe this what does the Bible believe or what does the Bible teaches our church this and my church better than your church in the let me tell you what we have down here it's a religious war not a church war come on talk to me you, you, you see you don't understand who and what the church is you see the church is not a denomination it is not an organization it is not a religion the church are those who were called out of the world called into Christ called to be like Christ and called to do the work of Christ the church are those who are washed in the blood of Jesus they have repented of their sins they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they are living every single day in obedience to his word you can keep your religion and go to hell but I'm going to hold on to Jesus I'm going to hold on to my church and I'm going to go to heaven hallelujah come on talk to me somebody what preparation are you making we prepare for Christmas carnival everything bacchanal what preparation are you making for your soul if you were to die now diagnostic question if you were to die now where will you spend eternity if you want to be in the same position like this man, you know, every time I come to go to a funeral, if I don't see the dead face, I have not gone to a funeral. That is not obia. Neither is it superstition. It's just that I love to have a confirmation that the person 
read that they said dead really died. So I want to see their face. And there is another thing that happened when I looked them in their face like I did this morning and I saw this afternoon and I saw Mr. Moore. I said, here's something. You have gone before me. I don't know how close behind you I'm coming, but I know for sure if the rapture doesn't come, I'm going to meet you. Turn to your neighbor. Watch your neighbor in the eyes. Turn to them and watch him in the eyes. Say, I got dead. <laughs> you see, the only reason why I am living this long is because I have come to the reality where death is concerned and death afraid to take me. Amen. Because he know. All of us will die if Jesus doesn't rapture the church before. If Jesus doesn't come, whether your concept of the rapture is a taking away before or after, the fact is, he's going to come. And not all of us in here will be caught up. But if prior to what I am saying, you were not ready to be caught up after I'm through preaching, you better get ready. Because next week we could be shipping you, pushing you in here and, and reading before you. Amen. Like we read before him. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. And you behind me, he believe in God. You behind me believe also in my father. Come on, talk to me. It can be you next week. And therefore I don't mess around. I don't mix matters when it comes to the gospel. Amen. Sometimes my language may be colorful. But amen. But not disrespectful. Come on, talk to me, somebody. So what preparation are you making? The other question that I asked myself did, those individuals who die procrastinated, they put off or rejected or accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord before or when they had the opportunity to. How many of you here have raised your hand and given your heart to the Lord and today you are no longer with Christ? And I could only tell why many people are no longer with Christ is because they raise their hand to a religion and not Jesus. Because if you know how sweet Jesus is, if you know, if you taste and see how good he is, you will not, amen, hallelujah, leave Jesus for anything else. I will die a servant of God. I could do whatever young man out there is doing. You can do it, whatever young man out there is doing. Run the route, live the life, smoke the ganja. Live it up, womanize, you name it. I, I, you know, do you know that I have the choice to do the same thing? Yes. Do you know that all of us could be murderers? Oh, it is, it is in all of us to kill. Just that you ain't kill yet. You see, you don't understand scripture. Let me repeat that. I say it is in all of us. The potential to kill lies in all of us. But thank God for Jesus. <laughs> and not only thank God for Jesus. Thank God for where you are in the Caribbean. But the potential, the Bible says that out of the heart of man flow all of these things. But you know what Jesus does? Amen. He neutralizes. Amen. A lot of the things that you can do. Amen. Pastor, you could horn your wife, you know. Yeah. When you're going down this evening, you could take up something and go off in Kings Bay. <laughs> You know you could do that? Yes. Huh? You, you could do that? My wife is not with me 24-7. I could hold her. Some of, you, some of you don't understand the local palangs. I can be unfaithful to her. But thank God for Jesus. Come on, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. It is because of him there are some things that I will not do. Why? Because I am seeking, amen, to spend eternity with him. So there are some questions I want to, now that I have asked those diagnostic, diagnostic questions, I want you to pay attention to these and then I'm going to close. I think it is my responsibility, or I see it as my responsibility, brethren, to bring to your attention five 
things that you must net not forget. Write them down. Five things that you must not forget as long as you live in this life. Amen. You could forget everything else, but you see these five things? Do not forget them. Let, let me tell you also, you can forget your religion, but these five things, do not forget them. The first, we must never forget the purpose for which God has created us or for which we were born. And on that matter, let me say to you that you were not born in the image and likeness of God. Eh? You were born in the image and likeness of Adam. But Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. And therefore when God created Adam, morally Adam looked like God. He was holy. Come on, talk to me. You see, the image just speaks of the character of the individual. So whatever God is, Adam became. God made himself, not physiologically because God has no form. The Bible said God is a spirit. Come on, a spirit has no form. How many of you seen the spirits around here right now? Come on, can you see spirits? So God is a spirit. He has no form. And therefore, God, Adam didn't look physiologically like God, but Adam looked morally. <laughs> Righteous. Holy. But then Adam sinned. And then when Adam sinned, he had children. And those children were not born in the image of God. They were now born in the image of Adam. And the Bible says, for by one man sin entereth into the world, and death by sin, and for sin passeth upon all. So what was in Adam, he passed it on to Cain, that is why Cain could have killed Abel. Because murder came in. If you have bad mind, it's because sin came in. If you don't like your neighbor, it's because sin came in. Come on. And by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin and death passed upon all men. That is why Adam was created to live. But his choice of disobedience caused him to die. The Bible says, in the day thou eatest, you shall surely die. Adam died in the day that he eat or he ate. The said day he ate, he died. You see, you are know this day. Listen to me carefully. You see, the Bible, what the Bible says, a thousand years is like one day with the Lord. And one day is like a thousand years. No man ever lived beyond 969 years who was Methuselah. Amen. The longest man to live upon the earth. But Adam died 930 years. He didn't make the thousand year day. Uh-huh. Like back to Sunday school. So in the thousand year, Adam died. So in the day that God was speaking, it was not 24 hours day, brother. <laughs> he was talking about a thousand year day. And no man ever lived beyond a thousand years. No man ever who lived on this earth, Enoch was taken. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. Elijah was taken. But none of them lived beyond a thousand years on this earth. So Adam died in the day. Carry that to your priest and teach him that. Carry that to your pastor and teach him that. That in the day he ate, he died. And therefore you need to understand that God created all of us. God created Adam right about all of us were born. And we were born with an Adamic nature, with a sinful nature, with a nature to die. Adam was created with a nature to live. That is why if he had only ate of the tree of, 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 of life, he would have lived forever. But God had to block that out. The second thing that you need to understand that you must never forget. One, the purpose of God. Two, that the inevitability, certainty, inescapability and avoidability of debt you must never forget that never forget that debt is inevitable it is certain it is inescapable 
you cannot avoid it. Come on, we spend money in doctors to avoid dying, but we still die. Hey, some people during COVID did all kind of things. Some people like me took the vaccine and they still die. And all of you who they're saying vaccine is mark of the beast, you don't know your Bible. You listen to somebody else besides the word of God. The Bible said that the mark of beast will be given on your right hand. I got the vaccine on my left. Talk to me somebody. God cast a right hand and he mean left. In the, because God be true. Took it on my left. Come on talk to me somebody. This mark of the beast nonsense. And you need to understand that the mark of the beast is linked to an antichrist which is an act of worship to the devil. So they did all of that and they still die. Some people said they're not taking the vaccine. And guess what? They still die. So no matter what, beloved, death is unavoidable. The second thing is that you must never forget is to escape. In order to escape our eternal separation from God, serving Jesus is not an option. It's a must. Serving Jesus is compulsory. I said serving Jesus is compulsion. The third fourth thing you must never forget is that there is a judgment that awaits all of mankind. I don't care how handsome you are. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care what you have. I don't care what you don't have. There is a judgment that awaits us. The pastor earlier quoted the scripture that says there it is appointed unto man once to die. Let me tell you something. Your appointment is not with death. You hear me my friend? Hey Candice you hear me? Your appointment shows you hear me? Amen Sheldon you hear me and you are? Sherry Ann. Who? Sherry Ann. Sherry? Sherry Ann you hear me? There is appointed unto man's one so that your appointment is not. Uh, amen. Alan appointment is not with death. His appointment is with the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after death. What happens after death? What happens after death? What happened after that, Pastor Atta? The judgment, all of us, the Bible said, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account to Almighty God for the things that we do in this body. The fifth question that you need to and must never forget is that earth is not our final destination. All those devils walking around with two legs and other thing and telling you that this is our final destination. When you see them say, I bind you in Jesus name. You're nothing but an agent of Satan. Because this Bible didn't teach me that. It is appointed unto man one. The earth rather is not our final destination. Neither is the grave. Where we lay him today. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. Amen. Given the fact that I spent some time. And I led this man to the Lord. He prayed after me. At the end of the day. God knows the heart. Because some people honor him with their lips. But their hearts are far. It is only God who knows. That when Alan repeated. Amen. Those prayer. Amen. After me. Whether he was sincere or not, I remember saying to him, Alan, listen to me carefully. You have no choice now. You are like the thief on the cross. Amen. Who didn't have a choice. Amen. And when he was there, he said, Lord, remember me in paradise. I say, Alan, look at your state. You could hardly move. You can't whine as you used to. You can't run women as you used to. If you used to do it, you can't come on dance as you're used to. You can't do all the things that you're used to. Come on, talk to me. Look at your state. What, that, what God is going to bring you back for, Alana? Amen. Except to be a testimony for him. But if God doesn't bring you back, make sure that you make your eternal destiny sure with God. Repent. Repent. I let him in the prayer. But at the end of the day, it is God who knows the heart 
It is not the prayer that he prayed after me, but it's the prayer that came from his heart that God hears. God will honor. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Some people look at others and the life that they live may be one that is distasteful, but you don't know. Amen. I don't believe in dead bed repentance, but I know that it is possible. I don't preach it as a doctrine, but I know it can happen. And some people may live wicked all their lives. Amen. And you may be a goody, goody, churchy, churchy person. Come on, talk to me. And that person give their heart to the Lord because God knows their heart and the angels of heaven rejoices over that sinner that repented and because you think you did not steal, you did not womanize, you did not organize, you did not manmunganize, you did not womanize. Come on, talk to me. Some of those are my own words. If people can make up their own words, then I can. You may not do all of those things, but my God, your life live life is not one that was surrendered to God. You will go to a devil's hell and the man who lived wicked and he surrendered his heart to God went on the dead dead or in a crusade. He will hear come he blessed of my father. Inherit this place that was prepared for you. So the earth is not your final destination. I'm closing. Neither is the grave. You know what is our final destination? Heaven or hell. It might be good to preach a night nice comforting word. Tell them let not your heart be troubled. Be encouraged. But there is no more comforting words than to find out that your life is ready to meet with God and that is why I preach the way I preach in funeral and therefore heaven or hell and let me say to you in closing now that you know what the two eternal destinies are some of us in here if we do not change our life we will end up in hell Amen. if we change our lives we are going to end up in heaven and religion fools you, you know, I, that is why I don't like religion and I preach kingdom brother. I don't like religion for them dotishness. Huh? If a Pentecostal die, he go on to heaven. If a Baptist die, our brother gone or sister gone to be with the Lord. If an Adventist die, they gone to be with the Lord. If a Catholic die, we gone to be the Lord. Why you can't say if he die, he gone to be with the devil? Because that book tells us that narrow is the way that leads to salvation and few how many will find it few broad is the way that leads to destruction of hell and many so how come everybody who die going to heaven that's what religion does so you stick to your religion, you live compromising, you live all kind of double standard, and when you die, the priest or the pastor or the pundit or whoever you call him, the imam is going to come and say, our brother has gone to be with the Lord. Amen. Don't preach those nonsense. I don't preach those nonsense. I preach Bible. And listen to me. In COVID, after COVID, the Lord said something to me. First time I've heard it this way. How many of us know that our choice determines our destiny? All of us know that, right? All of us have preached that, right? We have heard that, right? But you know the Lord told me that is wrong. You see, if you preach religion, you will say that. Your choice determines your destiny. However, your destiny has to do with choice. But listen to me carefully. Your destiny. It's the other way around. Your destiny must determine your choice. <laughs> you see, the choice destiny thing is, is, is a whoops thing, is a, a guess thing. But if you understand that your destiny determines your choice, you will live better. I will live better because we understand that there are two destinies. What are the two destinies? What are the two destinies? And you have to pick. If you want to go to a heaven, every 
choice you make now must be in keeping with you wanting to go to heaven. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know, we sing, I know where I am going. I know. You know why? Because you know you want to go to heaven. You know that there's something you have to repent of your sins. You want to go to heaven, you know you have to live holy. You have to obey the words of God. Come on, talk to me. If you want to go to hell, then you just make decisions in keeping with going to hell. John is my good friend, so I could talk to John. Come on, talk to me. My friend, if you want to go to hell, my sister, if you want to go to hell, just make decisions in keeping that will qualify you for hell. But if you want to go to heaven, you have to make decisions that will qualify you for heaven. Let's stand for prayer. So your destiny determines your decision. I'm going to teach you something here. While you're standing, and listen to me carefully. Revelation was in effect, in effect before Genesis. Listen to me again. I said Revelation was in effect before Genesis. You wouldn't know that. You see, God, you, if you're building a house, guess what? You must know what the end product looks like first. Isn't that so? But you don't start to build a house from the roof. Where do you build it from? So Jenny X, Revelation is the roof. <laughs> because God knew what the end product will look like. But yeah, I mean, in order to get to Revelation, he backs us up to Genesis. Where it all begins. Roof don't start with roof. Roof begins with foundation. But we're going to get there. And I'm saying to you, if you understand where you want to go, start with foundation. What is the foundation? Repent. And don't tell me that you are not a sinner. The Bible says, if any man say he have not sinned, he's a liar. If any man say he do not sin, he make God a liar. Because Paul said, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. In iniquity I was shapen in sin. Come on, talk to me. So we start from now. How many of you here? If you want to be religious, just keep your hands down. Because I'm not about religion. If you want to be righteous, I want you to lift your hands. If you want to be righteous, just lift your hands. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I just want to lift your hand. You want to be righteous. Come on, you want to be righteous. And righteousness is, 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 is dependent on a relationship with God. Not a relationship with your church. The church only experiences a manifestation of your righteousness. So I'm a pastor of Dreams of Power Pentecostal Church. I'm not a Pentecostal. Sorry for you, you go around people say, me a Anglican, me a Baptist, me a Methodist, me a Catholic. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have heard those things, my friend? Everybody, me a, me a, me a, me a, me a, me a, me a. I am a child of God. Washed in the blood of Jesus. That's who I am. And that's who you ought to be. Now I know all of us want to be righteous, but how many of you want to be a child of God? Because you see the Bible says in this world are manifested the children of God and the children of the devil. So somehow that is, that is not my word. The Bible says are manifested. Children of God and children of the devil. So how come when everybody die they're going to heaven? Them thing ain't even make logical sense. That's not Bible. You are a child of God based on your act of repentance. Not the asking of forgiveness of sins. Some people ask God for forgive. God, forgive me my sin tonight and tomorrow you're going back to sin. Yeah. No sins. God, that God didn't want that. God want that. That's why the first gospel that came out of his mouth was repent. The apostle Paul, repent. The apostles, repent. John the Baptist, repent. 
What repent mean? A change of heart, a change of life, a change of direction. Come on, a 180 degree right about turn. Come on, you, you, you need to, amen, repent. You see all those who want to repent today and give their heart to Jesus. Just lift your hands. I'm going to pray with you from where I am. Come on, I see those hands. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Hey, don't watch who. If you, if you, in church, if, if you are standing up next to one of your members in your church, not afraid to lift your hand. Push away the face and lift your hand. Because this is not about them. This is about your eternal destiny. This is about your salvation. And if you try to took you and say you will you lift your hand from our tell pastor say you and pastor mine are your business this is about my salvation those of you who have lifted your hands I want you to repeat after me say Lord Jesus I heard your word today that I need to repent and Lord I repent of my sins I recognize that there is no heaven without repentance there is no eternal destiny with you without choosing to serve you and today we declare that we will serve you in spirit and in truth lord i ask for forgiveness at this point in time of all my sins in jesus name in jesus name amen turn to your neighbor say neighbor you are now saved and so we will look for the queue when the family is satisfied and then the others will file you. Is that okay? And so we'll just like that. Ask the family to stand up and take your time together. Thank you. All family members to rise up and watch it in the family. But we want to ask the family just to go proceed. Time. Embrace each other if you have to. Support each other if you have to. Let it out. Amen. All family members. And while we are doing that, we want to thank everybody for coming. We want to thank you for support. A level of support. We thank you very much. Alright? That's what I'm saying. Give them the time. Give them that time. Give them a good 10 minutes. Alright? So that they can embrace each other.
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For as much as it has pleased our Heavenly Father, in his wise providence to take unto himself our beloved Alan Moore, a.k.a. Charlie, we therefore commit his body to the ground, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who shall change the body of our humiliation and fashion it anew in the likeness of his own body of glory, according to the working of his mighty power, where it is able to subdue all things. You may now take some dirt into your hands if you so desire. We be our last rites, the living to the dead. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and committing this body to the grave. The dust returned to the earth as it was, the spirit gone to be with God who gave it. I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, said the Spirit of the Lord, that they may be rest from their labor, for their works do follow them.
motivate the men at the work. Somebody said they want some chorus.
Everybody, the pastors, the grave diggers, the family, friends, everybody for supporting all those online. Thank you very much. Who is you? God bless you all. This is our last one. 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 Sir, 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 sir,